my dad says that they spend more money in Panama in five months than they do in Wisconsin in seven. Welcome back to another episode of El Podcast. Today we have special guest Doug Minnell, who left Canadian winters behind in 2008 for Panama's warmth and affordability. Doug lives very near to my parents, about a three minute walk in San Carlos, Panama, and he's lived there for the last 15 years. Why don't you start us off, Doug, by giving us kind of your quick intro on why you moved to Panama. We started looking at Latin America in 2008, and we were getting tired of Canadian winters, and we're looking for a warmer place, and where we could live less expensively because even back then, Canada was getting to be more and more expensive for someone out of fixed income. We did a trip after my investigations. We did a trip to uh, Costa Rica and to Panama. We had the week in each country, and Panama won that hands down. Uh, we felt more welcomed in Panama than we did in Costa Rica. It may be different today. Don't know. This was, what, 12, 13 years ago. We came back to Panama for months and liked it and then came back for, I guess, maybe six months or so. So we grew into an appreciation of where we wanted to live and how we wanted to live down here. We did the country twice in a car. That's not that difficult because Panama is not that big. But we went from Panama City to the Costa Rican border twice just to see different places in the country and where we wanted to live. And finally settled in the beaches area about an hour and a quarter from Panama City towards the Costa Rican border. It seems like a lot of the expats that decided to live in Panama checked out Costa Rica. And it seems like Panama is maybe half the price and maybe a more stable government. You also have the U.S. dollar in Panama versus Costa Rica, where you have, what is it, the Colón or the Colones? How seriously did you consider Costa Rica? I did a lot of research. did a lot of research reading the international living books and coverage of each of the countries. I expected Costa Rica, before we went to the two, I expected Costa Rica to come out and talk. There's a huge echo awareness there, ecological awareness there that you don't necessarily find in Panama so much. For that reason, then they have a higher profile on the world. I expected to decide that Costa Rica was the place for us to stay. One of the things about the two countries is that we ran into beggars in Costa Rica who were quite willing to solicit firmly for our help, including a kind of a what sounded like a scam at the time. And we didn't see any beggars here in Panama. That's a small thing. We just found generally Panama to be more welcoming of expats, of strangers, of very different people like us, because we are really different than Panamanians. As you know, having spent time in Costa Rica, we're extern heralds down here. We stand out. I thought we stood out more in Costa Rica. Now, maybe that's because in Panama, they had the U.S. forces down here for 100 years, and they were used to people like us wandering around and spending money. Don't know. At any rate, we didn't give it a huge amount of thought. We went with our gut and decided to spend more time here after that initial experience to see if it still felt right. Did you consider Belize or Mexico or Ecuador? Those are uh, countries that generally come up or... Colombia. A lot of expats do medical services in Colombia. Did any of those countries cross your mind besides Costa Rica? Mexico, certainly, because it's closer, it's bigger. It's a very cosmopolitan country. But there were too many stories of people getting killed, not necessarily extern heroes. Mexico can be a very violent place. And so we rejected Mexico. Ecuador came up and it was on a possible visit list later, but we decided that Panama spoke to us, and so we didn't see the need to go anywhere else. If I were doing it today, actually, if I were starting today, Ecuador would come up near the top of my visit list. I would not move to any country without visiting 
and making a serious visit first because whatever you read, whatever you think, it's not that way. It will be different. Your experience will be different. It takes time to soak time, if you will, to really get the culture more into your awareness than it would be if you visited a week and came back and decided to live there. I've seen people do that, and I think, what were you thinking about? Because inevitably, after two months, six months, whatever it is, they find that things weren't what they hoped or thought it would be, and they start making changes. You've been in Panama since about two eight. I mean, I think the most critical question that people have when they're thinking about relocating to a foreign country ultimately just comes down to dollars and to the financial component. How much cheaper is Panama than where you were at in Canada? It then was probably half the cost, if not even less. I mean, every place is getting more expensive. We go back to Canada and we're horrified by what it costs. And the costs here are going up too, of course, so it's around the world. I'd say right now it's probably at least half the cost to live here. That's having a house we're not renting, but just normal everyday costs and living living very comfortably here. It's easy to do at least half of what it would cost us back in Canada. Do you have any ballpark numbers? What can a person expect for, say, rent or housing or going out to eat? If you're willing to live frugally here, you could probably live for 2000 U.S. dollars a month. 2500 makes you quite comfortable. You can go out to eat here like any place. You can spend a lot. You can spend a little. You can probably eat here while not not really in a rich fashion, but fairly well for 10 to $15 per person per meal. You can spend a lot more, of course, too, if you want. The things like rent, you can probably rent a house away from the beach for something like $900 a month for a small house. You can also spend $2,500 a month on the beach if you want a fancy uh, condominium apartment. And Somewhere in between is where most people would wind up. So for about 2000 a month, that is 2500 U.S. dollars. You think you could live a pretty comfortable lifestyle that might run you, what, 5000 U.S. dollars in Canada or $5,000 in the U.S. or Florida? Is that kind of what you're saying? I'd say that's probably a good ballpark, yes. And you're from Canada, Doug. So yeah, I, I often hear that. Canadians, since you have that universal health care, when you go to a foreign country, do you then lose your health care when you go back to Canada? Or how does that work as a as a Canadian? If you're not in Canada for, I'm not sure in the months, I think it's at least five months a year. And it depends. Canada's health care is provided provincially and every province has a little bit different rules. But if you're out of Canada or more than seven months of the year, you lose your health care coverage until you're back in Canada for at least five months. There's two provinces which let you come back in, and as long as you're re-establishing residence in the province, you get your health care back. The problem with free health care today is that it's stressed, and you're immensely stressed today because of the COVID overload, which they've never really recovered from. And Canada is not unique in that, but the provinces in Canada certainly have problems right now providing health care. And as an example, finding a doctor can be extremely difficult who is willing and able to take on new patients. Are you a full-time Panamanian resident or do you still go back to Canada? We still go back to Canada. I don't use the Canadian health care system. We find that what we can find here in Panama for healthcare is really quite good, really good. And you you can make an appointment for the next day and go in and see any uh, general practitioner. And for a specialist, you can probably count on getting an appointment the following week. Would you say the healthcare in Panama is comparable to that in Canada? Well, I haven't had a lot of recent experience with Canada. I would say right now, if you pick and choose the healthcare people and doctors that you're dealing with, it's probably better here because they're more accessible. 
And they're not as rushed. They're not harried. Like, I remember Canadian healthcare professionals being. You've been there since 2008. So you've been in Panama for like a decade and a half. What are the main reasons that expats move down and, and how long do us actually stay? Like, have you been there longer than the vast majority of people that you've known from Canada and the U.S. and the U.K.? Or, or are you like the, the typical expat? No, we came down with a, a very small wave at the time that wasn't nearly as popular as it has become since. And we're, we're not here permanent, but we're here a lot. And many of the expats are snowbird-style expats. They come down in the winter and go back home in the summer. The number that we knew at the beginning, because there was a group of us that kind of banded together in the early, early days, many of them have gone back, some have died, and very few are left. If you take an average hundred people who were down here then, most of them are gone now in one way or another. So people come down, they experience the lifestyle, they enjoy the lifestyle, and then they tend to go back home. A lot of them it's health because they're not as healthy as they used to be and they want to get their health care back home. A lot of it's family in that they realize that they've got opportunities that they're missing as grandparents through the year. And the culture here is really, really different. And not everybody is comfortable staying here for an extended period of time. The differences can wear you down over time. We still complain when things don't happen the way we want, but we'd be doing that back home. It just would be different things. There's all bunch of reasons people don't stay, and many in the long term don't stay. Some do, and some have stayed until they die. We've got friends who have stayed here and died here. It's not a bad place to grow older and older and to continue to exist. One of the things about Panama is, is that they respect people of an advanced age and you get treated differently than I remember being treated back in Canada. You're not ignored because you're old. You're actually, you benefit because you're older. And that's a positive. That's a real positive to stay. What do you find to be the best aspects? What would you say is something that you just wouldn't find in Canada? I guess the weather is obvious, but... There's the physical aspect of it. The weather, the proximity to the beach. We're on the beach and we're able to walk to the western Pacific shore of Panama. Walk into the water that feels warm. It's not a shock when you walk in. The culture here is... There's a kind of a subset of expat culture here now that wasn't here before. And there's probably 10 restaurants that have live entertainment because they found the pulse people. And, and you can go and have a meal and be entertained with an entertainer that's oriented towards an expat audience. Some of them are expats themselves. And either want to do the gigs because they get joy out of it or because they appreciate making the money. Do you think a lot of expats would prefer Florida over Latin America if they they could afford it? A lot of the the expats in Costa Rica and Panama and Colombia kind of ended up back in Florida at some point, like you're saying, family reasons. or My mom kind of had a, a health scare in Panama, falling off a ladder and having a compound fracture in her arm, and it was just like this major fiasco running to the emergency room in uh, San Carlos and then having to go all the way to Panama City and, you know, get in line. They charge you before you can even see a doctor. I was there when that happened. It was a pretty stressful situation that if we were in the U.S. would have been a fairly typical day. There's a lot of things I liked about living in Latin America, but if I was like 75, I don't know if I would take the chance. I remember that incident. I wasn't there, of course, but I do remember hearing about it. The proximity to emergency health care, depending on where you live, is probably not as good here. The San Carlos, they call it a hospital, or we call it a hospital. It's not really a hospital, it's a clinic. And they're set up and managing to help people who come in having sliced their leg with a machete or who need stitches for something that's happened to them. And really serious stuff, they don't necessarily have the expertise. The, the doctor in call in the hospital isn't there permanently, 
they're rotated through because it's one of the requirements of the medical profession here to spend some time in the hinterland hospitals. And some of them are quite new doctors, and so they're just being rotated through and they're here for a month or two or whatever the period is. And who you get to help you depends on the moment, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. So that's an extra element of risk. You mentioned risk, and there are different risks here than there are back home, and that's perhaps one of them. Where we've used the San Carlos Clinic from time to time, when Linda, who we found out has a severe allergy to mango sap, and you can get exposed to that when they burn mango wood or mangoes themselves in a fire, and the smoke comes into your lungs, and you all of a sudden they're in the anaphylactic shock. We went in there, and they had seen that before, and so they knew how to treat it. We had a good experience when that happened. Florida. People going back to Florida. We had friends who had, quite wealthy friends, who had an apartment here in the beaches and another major apartment in the city. And they were down here for two or three years and then decided they didn't want to live in the lifestyle down here and went back. And they are Canadians, but they bought a place in Florida in a settled community there. Definitely a North American experience that they chose to settle themselves into. That's why I'm recommending constantly, if anyone asks, that you spend some time here before you commit to it. Don't cut your bridges behind you. Come down here and experience it at least for months, and three months is even better before you make any absolute changes in your life. And there's lots of opportunities down here to rent for those three months and to find out whether it's really suitable for you or not. And for many, it's not. When they come down, spend up to a year here and go back. I've noticed some of my parents' friends will do three months, one country, then the next year they'll do three months, another country. It seems like the three months is the easiest point because you can get a tourist visa for three months to a lot of countries and just rent. So you're never really committed. What do you think of that strategy? For others, I think it would be an ideal strategy. We have some friends who do house sitting. And they were, they were here for, I'm not sure, four or five years and decided they wanted to see more of the world. And so they go, and you're really not sitting in the house. More often, you're just sitting the pets. People want somebody in their house to take care of the pets and not board the pets out of house. They're basically, I think, doing Europe. And they're on Facebook, and they talk about the experiences, and they're having a ball doing that. That's pretty gypsy-like for, for me and for us. I think for those that want a lifestyle like that, or maybe, as you say, three months here, three months there, I think that could be quite wonderful if, you're, if you've got the flexibility to do that. Yeah, you're in Panama. Spanish is the, the primary language. Do you think that's a barrier for people to kind of transition to speaking in a, a second language? You mentioned Europe where you can get by in Europe on just English, and most of Asia, they speak English at least fairly well. What do you think about the language barrier? Do you not really feel that as an actual barrier? Oh, it's an absolute natural barrier unless you speak the language. There's no question about it. You can't optimize your existence here unless you have some Spanish. There's no question about that. When we came, our second language, of course, was French. So that's been lost now. Although the old French word pops into a Spanish conversation because it's just what comes to mind. We started renovating this house. You were here. I think you were to our house. And it was just a small house, and we started renovating it. And I acted as the foreman and spoke Spanish with the workers and didn't speak any English. And that, for me, was a very intense Spanish learning experience. I still speak pretty good construction Spanish, and beyond that, it's hit and miss. I think that without any Spanish, we wouldn't have the flexibility of lifestyle that we now have. There's a lot more younger people in the stores now who speak English because they're being taught in schools and they want to practice their English, but most of them don't have English. And you can search yourself through a lot of situations better if you've got the modicum of Spanish. You don't have to be fluent here. You just have to be able to communicate. We have a, a living worker on the property and I talk to him every day in Spanish, so I'm getting practice all the time. It's a very, very good idea, 
If you don't have Spanish, to get at least the basics of it as soon as you can when you're here. So many people coming out of the U.S. have Spanish, and they don't seem to have problems when they get here. You've been in Panama for 15 years. If you had to do it all over again, do you think you would pick Panama as your primary country in 2023, or, or would you explore some other options, or do you think Panama is the best place for Americans and Canadians to retire to? I don't think there is any best place for everybody. The best place is a very personal judgment. You should probably explore a few places before you decide what the best place is for you. Panama is really good. They're used to expats. There's a very sophisticated environment here in terms of shopping. You can get anything you want in terms of having the house and lifestyle that you want. But that's not unique. I think Ecuador actually would be of interest to me right now if I was looking. And Colombia. Colombia is a much larger country than Panama. You mentioned medical tourism in the Colombia. We have some friends who did that, and they were very well treated there. Its sophistication is much higher than Panama's sophistication. And you can get accommodation at the sea level. You can get it at what I call spring level at 20 or at 2,000, 2,500 feet up. And you don't have the heavy, humid atmosphere that you tend to at sea level. Ecuador is even more interesting because you can go further up and you can get really spring-like conditions there. And it's very inexpensive. Now, that means, of course, that the sophistication isn't there and you have to be willing to live a far simpler lifestyle. It all depends on what you want out of your time that's out of your home country. Just building on what you said earlier, I think taking those three months and choosing, if you've got the flexibility, choosing to live in four or five different countries for those three months or longer would be a really good idea so that you could settle on what might be the best country for you to settle in. A lot of people, when they think about moving to a foreign country, safety and security is at the top of their mind. How do you feel about safety and security in Panama versus in Canada? We, we, we have, I have bad stories about both and good stories as well. In Canada, we lived in a very settled neighborhood when we were younger, and neighbors across the street had a home invasion happen. It was a very negative experience for them. We didn't experience any of that in Canada. People here have had the equivalent. They opened the door in the morning and they were invaded and everything robbed and they were bound. And so that was all, a Panamanian home invasion. We had our fence cut here many years ago. And you cut a fence here not to get in because it's easy enough to hop over. You cut a fence and widen the fence so the dogs will leave because we've always had dogs here. And if dogs can leave, then the, the place is not protected. Our dogs didn't leave, and so nothing happened to that. I just rewired the fence, and life went on. In general, I think it's probably safer in Canada than it is here. But I don't feel unsafe here. We don't flash money around. We don't do things that don't make sense. And we have the dogs here on the property. And now, actually, we have a worker who lives on the property. He's not here for protection, but he's here as a Panamanian and would give thought to any Panamanian that was thinking of trying to rob us all. I don't don't feel that we're at risk here to any significant extent. Having said that, there's parts of Panama City where we don't go if we go into the city because it's not got a good reputation. What do you think are some of the investment opportunities for people that are looking at the baby boomers? The Western countries, there's this massive cohort of people that are in the hundreds of millions that are reaching retirement age. What do you think are entrepreneurship opportunities? Well, generic opportunities are servicing the old. If there's more old and the old tend not to be so old today as they were before. What is it they say, 70s and new 60 and so on. Older people tend to be more active now than they were before. And if 
they've got a reasonable amount of wealth behind them if they're comfortably well off this age at my age you're not looking to buy stuff because you've had all the stuff you ever want hopefully I think what you're looking for is experience. And so there's a real opportunity to start packaging experiences for those that are older, or maybe for everybody today, but certainly for the older, I think they will buy into experiences. And you probably see that evidenced by some of the cruise tours and some of the tours of other countries is that it's an experience tour more than anything else. What year were you born, Doug? Oh, that's a, a funny way of asking how old I am. <laughs> I was born in 40. That makes me 78. Wow, that's pretty pretty amazing, Doug. How do you approach health and longevity? Do you have any regimens to stay pliable or healthy or flexible or youthful? I try to stay active. I play squash. We played the pickleball in the middle of the week. I spent a lot of time at the computer, and I don't do it sitting. I've created a standing desk, and so I spend three or four hours at the computer. I'm not sitting, because that's very hard on the hips. I stand and perch my butt on a tall stool, that sort of thing. We try and do yoga. I have yoga scheduled three times a week. The challenge lately has been meeting that schedule. It's important to keep flexing your body, because as you get older, it becomes less flexible if you don't keep it in movement. From a longevity point of view, I mean, we all know we're going to die sometime. I'm not planning to do it. We have, as I think I mentioned earlier, changed our diet tremendously. There's an awful lot going down on the Internet today about longevity, much more than there was 10 years ago. There's the blue zones we talked about. There's four or five elements to being in a blue zone and living that lifestyle. But the first and most important one is the food that you eat or the food you don't eat. And we really changed our diet significantly. We still enjoy food, but we eat far more carefully than we used to. What changes have you made to that diet? Oh, very little meat. Meat, maybe once a week, and a lot of that's fish rather than red meat. Veggies, of course, reign supreme. We avoid the more starchy vegetables as well. We look for nutritional density in foods, and we don't eat as much. I'm down to two meals a day, and Linda's down to one meal a day, and we're both slim and healthy. You don't think that, like, say, a steak, though, is nutrient-dense? It is, but it's full of bad nutrients as well as good nutrients. And I can't rhyme out what's so bad about a steak I'm more influenced by things like the China study and by more recent studies where they look at people who don't eat much meat, they tend to live longer and, more importantly, healthier ends of lives than people that eat a lot of meat. I mean, I think the China study has had a lot of flaws in it, but... I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But there's other studies that say the same, they move in the same direction. I can also show you people that tried being vegan for 10 years and switched back to meat because they were not healthy and their health was regained. It's like deciding where you want to live. A lot of it is so personal and you can accept the general guidelines and then fill in the the blanks. Do you feel like as you've gotten older that your body just requires less meat though or is that like is that a shift that you think is more intuitive versus just reading information? I enjoyed meat tremendously when we were eating it. So the switch from meat is not because it felt better not to eat meat, but because the studies that I've been following have indicated to me that I'd be healthier if I didn't eat meat. You said you're 78. Do you feel like you're ever going to move back to Canada? Or do you think Panama is your home until you're no longer on planet Earth. Okay, that's a good way to phrase it. I don't think so, no. There's a good possibility of us not being here for the next X years. I don't know, pick a, pick a number of years, who knows? There's no plans right now. There's an awareness that it, it will likely have to happen. You mentioned the Blue Zones before, and I've read the Blue Zones book a couple times, and one of the components that they've really talked about for people that live to be 100 years is the social component. And was it like some region in Italy where 
they drink wine like it's going out of style, yet they live to be over 100 years old because there's this massive social component that they have. How do you feel the social component is in the expat communities of Panama? I think it's probably stronger than we experienced back home. Back home, of course, we were working, and you have your work associates, and you have friends that you have a little bit of time you can spend with them, and you have activities. We curled, for instance, and we did other things, and there's groups that you associate with that way. But it was not intense. That's probably not a good word, but it gives the idea. You you can have better friends here than we had back home. Um, you have more time to spend with each other, and you have more time generally, of course. Making friends here and, and keeping them is not difficult, and... That's probably true in Canada, too, if you're oriented that way. My parents have been in Panama for quite a few years. You know, up there, along with you, I think, of the people in your area in terms of longevity. And my, my dad says that they spend more money in Panama in five months than they do in Wisconsin in seven. And so for them, it actually costs more money than being back in the States. I think everyone has this impression that you can move to one of these countries and it's significantly cheaper. But like you were saying before we recorded that, you could spend $2 million on a beach house or some condo. People think you're going to go to Panama or Costa Rica and get a beach house for $200,000 or something, maybe in the 90s or 80s. But I mean, those days are done, right? I mean, you're not getting a, you're not getting a beach house for under a million dollars in Panama or Costa Rica in 2023, are you? No, nowhere. Well, I don't know about a million. There's, I mean, anywhere close to the city or close to a civilized city here, you'd have to spend a fair bit of money. They're not making any more beach. And if someone's done a development there, it's going up in value consistently. There's no question about it. You said your father said that he spends more money here than in five months than he spends in Wisconsin in seven. That's an astonishing detail to me. Um, I don't know anything about Wisconsin, nothing, except the one time I went through it, there were all the dead deer at the side of the road because it was that time of year. My fiance and I were back in Wisconsin last year for a month, and we were getting 20-cent wings. So you get 10 wings for $2, and we were getting half chickens for 7 bucks at bars, getting $3 Bloody Marys, dollar fifty pints of beer hamburgers for three dollars out at the the pub wisconsin is one of the cheaper states it just depends where you're at okay well, we certainly spend less money here than we would in any part of canada that i'm aware of in terms of their living costs and we don't eat out we go to a restaurant very very seldom so that's not part of our lifestyle and we're meeting a lot of vegetables so from that point of view our Food costs are quite low here, relatively low. Everything is just kind of relative. It depends. I always say, like, you know, I've been to over 50 countries. I lived abroad for over five years, and people are always like, oh, what's your favorite country, Jesse? Like, what's your, you know, what do you recommend? And I think it really just depends on the people you meet, the friends that you have, the experiences that you have. And if you were to go back, you probably couldn't even duplicate those experiences. It's really kind of kind of hard to say. Like you said, yeah, you could go live in a country for three months and then come back the next year and that whole three months could be a completely different experience if the people that you were say hanging out with or something all left it's just it is what what you make it like you cannot run away from yourself it's kind of like the analogy of the distraught wanderer where they're unhappy everywhere they go because they're unhappy with themselves and they project that into the country like if you're not happy switching your location isn't going to change anything it, it really just depends what you want my parents said they chose panama just because Florida wasn't hot enough, depending on why you want to move somewhere, is really going to determine your happiness. If you're just like, oh, I want to go there because it's cheap or this or that, maybe not the the right motivation because the, the time you move everything over and who knows, get screwed by some Panamanian tax office or you know, the embassy or something like that. I mean, it, it doesn't work out that way. I know a lot of people that had really horrible issues buying houses in Costa Rica and having to deal with the government and, and losing a lot of money. Well said, Jesse. Life is what you make of it, and you can make good things out of it wherever you are. And I support you 100% on that. In general terms, whether it's Wisconsin or Florida or somewhere in Canada or Panama or somewhere in Costa Rica, there's happy people around. 
in each of those places because they're doing the things that make themselves happy. When I've been out in Panama, one of the big components that, like, say, my parents really liked is that there's just a lot of people the same age that are retired, and everyone kind of has the same goal in life. They're at the same point in life. They all have the same kind of direction and the attitude. They have time off, so it's just easy to make friends. It's easy to have this big social circle. And I, like I said, going back to the blue zones, as you mentioned before, like, do you have a purpose in life? Like, we all need a purpose. And if you're just laying around Florida with no friends because all your family and other friends are still working, I think it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. Yes. Well said. Good philosophy. <laughs> Good philosophy. If you could do it all over again back when you moved in 2008, do you feel like you made the right decision? Would you do anything differently 15 years ago? Actually, the, the doing it differently would be before that. There's opportunities around the world that come up once in a while and only once in a while. The real opportunity in Panama was 2000 when the American forces left policing the canal. They had a real um, recession here because all of a sudden all of this money wasn't flowing into the country. You could buy property here really inexpensively and buy your beach property fairly inexpensively. That was something I wasn't aware of at the time, quite frankly, and I wish I had been. I hadn't started the search until after that. It comes back to deciding what you want in life and maybe looking ahead to see where you can find it. And in doing it, experience some of what you think, experience some of the areas where you think you might like to live more of your life and before you commit to them. It seems like what you're saying is do your research very thoroughly. Because you're right, if you would have identified like, hey, the 100-year lease that the, you know, the United States of America built the Panama Canal. I mean, they took it over from the French who basically got slaughtered by mosquitoes with malaria. And then they figured out how to actually er eradicate malaria. The Americans came in, built the pa Panama Canal, had a 100-year lease, and then that was taken over by the Panamanians in, what, 99 or 2000, you have all these zonies, which is the zone of the canal. And then you're right, yeah, there would have been so many financial opportunities. There's a real financial change coming in the world today because of the extreme debt. I follow John Malden, who's got a website. He's got a million people on his email list. Something to aspire for there, Jesse. He called it the Great Reset. He says the things we're doing now in a global financial sense, especially the governmental sense, we can't keep doing. And so when you can't keep doing something, it will change. We just don't know how it's going to change, but it will change. And we're going to be going through some very tough financial times in a world sense, in a country sense, um, before the reset happens. And if you can figure all that out, you'll probably do pretty well. People talk about a lot of the craziness going on right now. You're 78, so you've lived through the 60s. Do you see any parallels right now with, say, the 1960s or the 1970s? And then it seems like there'd be a lot of room where you can navigate yourself in terms of as an investor. That's a pretty big question there, um, uh, I mean, think about that. Parallels. Yeah, I think so. The big opportunity right now, huge, huge opportunity, is artificial intelligence. And it's exemplified by chat. And that's going to make a number of people billionaires. There's no question about it. And it could make someone down in the trenches who's getting in early and doing the right things quite wealthy. And so if I was... Maybe I shouldn't say if I was X years younger, maybe I should be looking at it down. Who knows? I have a friend who's very interested in Salesforce and becoming a Salesforce installer and has done some of the programs for Salesforce to learn how to do the installations. And chat GBT is being taken on by Salesforce. And I think the combination there is going to be truly incredible. And there's all kinds of People emerging now sell you courses and using chat. You don't have to take a course. You just have to start experiencing it. I'm not sure what the parallel is. The parallel might be with the rise of the internet. I think this is a new equal opportunity. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. 
on that dog. I mean, you're a programmer, so you kind of have a little more insight than some of these people. I mean, I was talking to one of my friends who's got a, a good friend who's a IT guy, and he's like, aren't you worried about like AI taking your job? And he's like, oh, no. And I just find it interesting because I use AI. I use ChatGPT for my podcast. I do. I use it for editing. I use it for for writing descriptions and titles and thumbnails and all sorts of things. Like it's basically like having two assistants. And I think people that are like, oh, I'm not worried about chat GPT or AI. You're really being short-sighted. And this is like a very early version of AI. Can you imagine in five years, 10 years from now, it's going to change the world. I can write. I appreciated you were using it already. We often hear people that kind of act as if 2023 is such a bad, a bad time to be alive. As someone that's 78 years old, do you feel like we're living through a, a good time in all the years you've been on planet Earth? Or do you think that society has regressed and has gotten worse? Rather than make a value judgment on it, I guess I'd observe that we seem to be in the more turbulent times than we might have been before. I mean, people talk of the 60s, for instance, as being a great change from the rather law and order oriented do what your parents did of the 1950s, which was absolutely true, into the 60s where you started doing what you wanted to do in life and had more personal sense of freedom. I think that we're living actually in somewhat similar circumstances now. And I think that the future, while it may be turbulent for a few years, will lead to a stronger future. And so Rather than fight the turbulence, try and ride the wave. What are the reasons for the turbulence right now? Like, what, What's so bad about society that we have this turbulence? I think the technology has betrayed us in some ways, and that's the social media. The social media has given voice to people that wouldn't have had a voice previously, and they're getting followers. And that's, what's the word, bifurcating? They're splitting countries into two parts those that are my side and those that are on the other side, and I hate the other side. And that's not the way I remember the past. And unfortunately, the coalescing of opinions is getting stronger and stronger. I think we have to get through that turbulence, and I'm hoping we will, without some kind of equivalent to a civil war. Strong words there, I know, but my gosh, when I listen to some people talk, saying, where is that coming from? The social media has to grow up in some way or be controlled in some way. I don't know how to do that. That's another recommendation, just an observation. Um, that the division of society into them and us is not the way I'd like to see it happen going forward. I tend to think that people will just spend less time online, and I think that's the wave of the future, more back to analog, so to speak. I don't know that I agree with you, actually. I don't think the keyboard is the magic vehicle. I think voice will become the magic vehicle because we're heading towards the time when we can talk to our computer and tell it what to do and what we want to do. And that rather than spending less time, we will have of the phone, um, smartphone or a smart entity in our pocket at all times, maybe even hooked into our skull, if you believe, Musk. And that's going to become more and more prevalent in time. Thank you, Doug, for, for joining us, talking to us about Panama, investing, social media, all sorts of things today here on our podcast. Well, thank you for listening to me for so long. I don't get a chance to talk so much anymore. I appreciate the time. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode.